This episode of Film Nut is brought to you by Kaimu Flowers, fresh orchids and tropicals from the lush, rich, volcanic coast of Hawaii. Welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I'm your host, Jeff Schubert. Glad you can join us for tonight's show. You can check out more episodes of Film Nut on demand at thestream.tv slash Film Nut. If you've got Twitter, you can follow us on at the Film Nut, and you can also like us on Facebook. Well, in baseball, they say chicks dig the long ball. In movies, everybody digs the cool car. From the 1956 DeSoto Firedome Seville in the movie American Graffiti to the Batmobile and the Duke Boys General Lee. But you know what? It isn't always about the coolness. Check out Al Bundy's Broken Down Dodge or Frank Costanza's Blue Ford Granada or Scooby-Doo's Mystery Machine. If it's true that a car is an extension of a person, then it's also true that it is an extension of a character in a movie, or as my guest might say, a character in his own right. In fact, my guest tonight is Fireball Tim. I like saying that. Um, he is the concept designer who has worked on over 350 projects, including designing cars for Batman, Thor, The Flintstones, Gone in 60 Seconds, The X-Men, G.I. Joe Rise of the Cobra, and for upcoming films, Captain America and Mission Impossible 4. Here is a man who truly loves what he does, and I love that, Fireball Tim. <laughs> hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Um, I love watching people do what they love doing, and they're good at it. And in going over uh, your website at hollywoodgarage.com, um, listening to your podcast, watching some of your uh, YouTube videos, it's clear you have a, a real passion uh, for cars and designing them, and look forward to talking to you right now about it. Absolutely. I, I, I think that you know, when I grew up, it was, it was two things that I loved, and, uh, and I realized you know, how much I loved cars, and I grew up in a, in a Hollywood family, so my, my parents, who were writer-producers, were always coming up with new stuff, and I was always trying to figure out a way to fit a car into what they were writing. Um, most of the time, it didn't fit, but... Um, uh, you know, they gave me uh, two things. It was uh, art supplies and it was die-cast cars. And, uh, and things really haven't changed. Uh, I still love art supplies. And, uh, and I still collect die-cast cars, and I still have cars that are a bit bigger that you can actually fit in now. <laughs> well, cars have changed a lot over the years. Um, but the first question I want to uh, throw at you, and, and maybe we'll get into more of then and now, if you will, from when you started to now. But what is um, your initial process? For example, you get contact, you get a script, do you, do you break it down, or, or how do you go about doing what you do when you get called for a job? It, it can actually, it, it has happened in a number of different ways. Uh, everything from a, a script showing up to they need something conceptually, uh, all the way to they have finished designs that they need to translate it into a build. So uh, um, every project is completely unique, different to itself. Well, let's pick, uh, let's say, Thor, for instance. Do they, does the studio contact you and say, hey, we need a car for a Norse god who's arrogant but a little depressed because he's been cast out of Asgard? You know what I'm saying? How does that? <laughs> yeah, well, for Thor, you know, we, we also, uh, sometimes the builds are not as glamorous as, a, as the Batmobile or things like that. Sometimes they're just military vehicles. Uh, sometimes uh, they'll pick something off the lot and then they'll want it painted a different color or they'll want it souped up or, the, you know, different applications. For Thor, it was simply that there were some military jeeps that were built um, and uh, had to be repainted, but there was a particular look that they wanted. Uh, it wasn't so much a design process as, and generally you, you can't conceptualize for too long because a lot of times it's like you got two weeks and you got to, you know, like in, uh, in Priest, uh, there were a couple of bikes that we built that were, were done in the, in the film, and we had about a week to build those two bikes, and that was it. So things have to move very fast. There's not a lot of time to conceptualize in now, some cases. Is there a difference between, let's say, a military car? Because I would imagine a military car, there's maybe not as much room for creativity because it's the military and you want to be authentic and you want to be what it really looks like. But in a fantasy or sci-fi, the military can be different. Uh, that can be the case, but as an example, in G.I. Joe, it's, it's a, a modern-based tale, so, but everything has a futuristic aspect to it, has a futuristic look to it. So uh, uh, there's certain applications that the vehicles have to, you know, have to achieve, and then there's, uh, there's a bit of fancy that you can go in and, and start adding uh, guns that look like they do things, but they don't actually do things. Um, and that's the fun part, is to come up with a look that, that sells the car as a character that, you know, people are going to look at this and say, wow, you know, I wouldn't want to meet that in a dark corner. But <laughs> that particular unit on it doesn't actually function. Um, a lot of it is just kind of gobbledygook that's, that's added to it to make it look really cool. 
Okay, now, now when you say conceptualize, uh, break that down for me, please. Mm -hmm. um, is it drawing? Is it using computer software? Is it then going back and forth with the director or production designer? How does that flow work? Initially, it's just uh, sketching out the ideas, uh, and you don't need a computer for that. Uh, you know, I've sketched on a napkin. I've sketched on the on somebody's palm. I've sketched on my own palm. You know, <laughs> um, it, whatever's in front of you, you sketch on. You know, if you're if you're having a meeting at a at a Dupar's, right. which you do, you would, or you have a meeting at the shop or or anywhere else. Um, the point is to get the ideas down on paper, um, to break down the script, uh, uh, however that works, and then to start to develop those ideas into more finished sketches so you get a clear picture of what that could be. Uh, Son of the Mask was a real good example of that, although it wasn't a great movie. The car was very cool. Now, I think we have a, a picture of the Son of the Mask. Mm -hmm. um, we'll pull that up for uh, when that's ready, that'll come up for us in a, in a moment, and then we can have you explain it, but go on. Well, it's uh, uh, initial sketches uh, that were just black and white. I think we have it right there. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was one of the early, early finished renderings based on a 1969 Roadrunner, which we ended up not using that. Originally, we were going to use a, a classic muscle car. We ended up using what was a... Um, uh, a um, in Australia, the, uh, the movie was so long ago, right. I'm trying to remember. Um, it's a, uh, a Pontiac here. And, and you can, the way you can tell is that in the, just in the roof line, you can see basically the only thing that's left in that vehicle is the shape of the window. So that wasn't touched. So things have to change sometimes that uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll have a certain car that you want to build. And an ex example for that, we want originally to use the Roadrunner. Uh, then that application didn't make sense. They wanted to be able to use a new car that, that was reliable and didn't have any issues. Uh, so we ended up going with that. Uh, it was a hold of Monaro is what it was. And then, um, uh, so you take that treatment that you did on the original and you apply it to the new car. Originally, the, the sketch had an eight foot tall rear wheel because they wanted it looking like a cartoon. So I'd sketch those up and did the finished renderings. And the way I work is I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, as much hand-drawn rendering as I can, and then I'll scan that and I'll finish that up on the computer. So it's, uh, it takes on a slick, more digitized look, but not so slick as, you know, a lot of the guys nowadays, they just work solely on the computer and everything looks photo real. And, and I, I like that artistic expression of it so that you, you, get a ch you, you see that although it has a slickness to it, it's still rendered, it still feels uh, gritty and a bit more real to me and um, in the sense that as an artistic piece. So. I enjoy that process. And so then at what juncture you get, at what juncture then are you showing your work to someone at the studio for approval before you take the next step? All, all the way from the initial sketch. You know, if you work with the director and, uh, um, you know, you'll sit down with a, a, some of the, the black and white sketches and he'll say, well, I like, I like this component and I like this component, so let's do another one, another version that's that and let's add color to that one now. So we'll go from uh, initial sketches to some color renditions, color versions. Uh, it might go as far as a 3D model uh, if there's time. If there isn't, uh, I'll take those sketches, give it to the shop, and the guys just start booking. Now, um, I wasn't kidding in my introduction. I, I have heard you refer to a car as a character in oh, a yeah? film. Um, can you elaborate on your thought process of that? Absolutely. I mean, um, uh, the cars are essential characters in the film. I think people would, would definitely uh, take uh, Knight Rider as an example. Can you remember who the actor was in the, the latest Knight Rider TV show? Right. Most people don't remember right. who the actor is, but everybody remembers the, the fact that the car was cool. Right. You know? And uh, you know, some, a lot of people weren't happy that it was a Mustang as opposed to a Camaro, you know, as a, the Firebird that was originally used. Trans Am, correct? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, uh, but people remember that because I think the people associate, have an emotional attachment to their vehicles. Uh, you remember growing up, you remember what your first car was, you remember where you were when you got your first kiss in that first car. You remember what, what movie you saw. You know, there's so much emotion that's wrapped up in your vehicle experience. And, and that's where the Hollywood garage came from, is merging the, the best of automotive enthusiasm, the people that love cars, and the people that love action movies. And you merge that together. And, and that solidifies. If people remember the Cobra from uh, the Cobra Mercury from the movie Cobra, uh, they'll remember that, yeah, the movie wasn't, wasn't too good, but oh man, that car. I mean, I grew up with that car. And then all these stories start coming out, you know? And, uh, well, you know, there are certain movies, obviously, you know, things like Batman or, or Scooby, there are certain movies where it's obvious the car has a natural imprint, or horror movies like Christine or, right. or something to that effect. But as I really started to dig into preparing for this episode, yeah. It, it's also the extension of the everyday characters, the Al Bundys, the, the Frank Costanzas, oh, totally. and, and so forth. Um, do you get involved with um, designing, you know, concept, conceptualizing cars for just regular, ordinary movies, or are they all science fiction? It's everything. Well, it's a little bit of everything. Um, uh, you don't have to go through a, a, a very elaborate design process if it's something that they pick some car off the lot uh, and then they 
they want it red or they want a different bumper or things like that. Um, working on a Steven Spielberg project now and, and the cars are very straightforward. But uh, um, to me, you know, when, when you create something that's purely conceptual, whether it's science fiction or it's action based or, or something for G.I. Joe or, or something for Priest, um, those are real great expressions because they become a, a, a combination of a, of a lot of people's thoughts. You know, I, I mean, I am a, a movie car designer, but I'm only as good as the people I surround myself with. And we have tremendous builders. Uh, the shop is called Cinema Vehicle Services. And uh, uh, there's fabricators and painters and guys that do stuff that, that are extraordinary, far better than I could ever do. And so at, at Cinema Vehicle Services, you have hundreds of cop cars, cabs, absolutely, all different kinds of. You have taxi cabs that are cut in half. Why do you have, why would you have a taxi cab that's cut in half? Well, you know, you, you can't always get the entire crew and, and the camera into the taxi to get the shot. So sometimes you just cut the cat the taxi in half and you mount it onto uh, the back of the truck you know, that has the camera, so that way you can shoot the actors. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's the reverse, so um, the front half will, you know, will use both sides. You know, you'll use the front, and when you see a taxi cab driver uh, driving, and then he turns around and talks to the guy behind him, generally he's talking to the camera, and there is no back of half of the taxi. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So those are called bucks, and, and uh, they're used for a variety of ways, in a variety of ways. Um, and sometimes they're created as simulator rides, so they'll bounce up and down. And the last thing you want is an actor worrying about driving while he's trying to act at the same time. So uh, uh, that's all you know, part of movie magic. Excellent. Well, let's uh, check into with the chat room and see if we've got any questions for you on the board. Uh, let's see. Ow, my head. Take some aspirin. Um, would like to ask, where did you get your start and what was the first car um, you designed for a movie? Uh, the first car was the, the Batmobile for the movie Batman. Not a bad first job, right? Not a bad first job. Uh, that was just some initial concepts. I, I really didn't have much faith in it. I think it was, um, uh, it was like, wow, what, what is this about? And you know, I, I didn't even know that people did that kind of thing. I wasn't at Art Center. I, was, I wanted to be a car designer. I, I didn't know the, the parameters that you could do. I ended up uh, working for Disney afterward for a few years. But that was the first, uh, the first car. I, I can't necessarily say that that was my first break because I didn't know that, wasn't, that was anything more than a couple of sketches and uh, a few ideas. Uh, but when the movie came out, and, uh, I think it was 89, um, I went and saw it and I was like, wow, I mean, look, look what happens. Look how fast you can turn around these, these things. You know, when, when, you, when you're a designer, uh, a car designer for, the, uh, for the, the automotive industry, you know, it's seven to 10 years before a concept you know, comes out and right. drive it on right. the street. He's right. like, oh, I worked on that when I was a little kid, you know? Right. And, uh, but, but this, the turnaround time is so fast in film, uh, it's really exciting and I love that energy. Uh, there's nothing better than being on set and, uh, and watching something that you conceptualize that, that went from a, a sheet of paper that you drew out an idea and the director said, yeah, that's cool, that's the one I wanna go with. And it goes to the shop and the guys build it it goes on set and they shoot it, and then a few months later, maybe sometimes a year later, uh, you go out into the theater and you watch it. You know, and you, you can affect millions of people in a very positive way, and and that's tremendous power. And I think with that power comes tremendous responsibility well, to, talking, to do your absolute best. We're talking about Batman, but a little Spider-Man kind of power and responsibility line there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> true. Do do you have a a signature addition to that Batmobile that? Ah, that was that was from my sketch. Sure. Um, no, I think that you know when you when you, I enjoy the initial concept phase. It's getting that initial idea out, and and I think that they kept that. I think they kept the the emotional attachment, that feeling. Because when I did those initial sketches, it was like, you know, I, I didn't want to go off of anything that I had seen before. Um, and there'd been a lot. You know, there there was George Barris's Batmobile from the, the Adam West uh, TV who you, show. Who you knew as a child, ironically. Oh yeah, I know yes. George very well. He's yeah. a, he's a great guy, and and uh, and he's been around forever. Um, I think he's 130 now. <laughs> uh, but he's, you know, and, uh, and he's done a tremendous amount of stuff. He's an icon. And, and, but there's a big gap between where George's day and, and my day now. You know, I went to school with Chip Foose and, and, uh, um, uh, and not, not, not really wasn't anybody in that realm. You know, there was Big Daddy Roth. And, and, uh, but I think that uh, when I did those initial sketches, I wanted to do something that was purely emotional. As to if, if, if I wanted to do a Batman movie, you know, what, what kind of idea would I want to generate? You know, and, and I wanted to do it on, on black cans on paper, so you really didn't see it that well. Uh, so there was an emotional attachment that people could look at, like, oh. You know, and I did a lot of keyframe art for a lot of different films. And, uh, and keyframe art is essentially um, uh, a frame from the movie to sell them on the idea why they should give, you know, they, they should give the director 
$200 million to do this film. And if they can look at that piece and say, oh, wow, well, that, you know, if we, if we can do that, we can do 10% of that, then that's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I wanted to do the initial sketches. And, and, uh, and I think that, that worked well for them. Sounds good. Starliner would like to ask, I am a fan of Steve uh, Stanford and Tom Taylor's style. Do you also do more traditional slash mild custom sketching? And who have been your influences? I do. I do quite a bit of, uh, of sketching for, for custom stuff. Uh, we do our own, our own vehicles for SEMA. Uh, I'm doing one right now, which is a, a, what we call uh, Project King Tahoe. Uh, uh, Stanford is, is a, there's a lot of great designers out there, great illustrators. And, um, and all those guys inspire me because, you know, it's not a competitive world. It's a creative world. And, and you, have to, you have to give not only into what you love, but you have to put those guys uh, uh, on your shoulders. You have to, you have to, when I look at, at, at Chip stuff or anybody else, and I, and I think it's cool, you know, I'll post that to my blog because I want people to see that and be inspired by those guys. Um, uh, there, I think some of the influences I had growing up were Sid Mead, was uh, Luigi Colani, uh, was an Italian designer. Um, there's just a lot of, there are tremendous guys out there uh, that are so good um, they inspire me daily, uh, but not necessarily even car designers. There's uh, Frank Stevenson, who's a car designer, a friend of mine. Uh, he's really good as far as um, uh, traditional vehicle supercars that are on the road. But, you know, I get inspired by all kinds of things. You know, um, it's all in the moment. Uh, um, it may be everything from the, uh, a turtle shell to, uh, to a flower to uh, the, the shape of a flame that, that I get, uh, you know, passing by uh, uh, something. I, I don't know. Right. It, you know, it, it can come from anywhere at any time. It's not something that you plan. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm inspired by those guys. And, and uh, um, uh, I love seeing uh, people uh, push that that envelopes that which which raises me to a higher level absolutely it's great you know whether you're a musician or uh, an actor an artist writer I, true artists get inspired by other artists great work absolutely I think that's one constant that you see through yeah, I need them yeah. I need them and uh, uh, you want to say oh you know I, when I was in school um, it was frustrating because you would look at somebody's rendering and you go like how how did you do that how did you know how did you achieve that and then when they finally uh, uh, sat you down and, and did it with you, you had that aha moment like, oh man, now I can do that too. And not only can I do that, but I can take that to the next level. And that's, that's the whole game in, in designing for Hollywood, is that the audience is very sophisticated and you can't do the same old thing. You know, Transformers is coming out, and in fact it's out already, and uh, uh, I'm gonna go see it tomorrow. And I'm hoping to see some things that I haven't seen before because uh, that's really what, what people expect. You, you don't want to go back and see the same old stuff. Well, it's interesting. Speaking of the sophistication of the audience, I want to also throw in the advancement of digital cameras. We had um, an Iron Man 2 camera operator on come on film that right before the, the release of the movie, and he was talking about these digital cameras that they attach to the cars and so forth. Mm -hmm. So again, between the sophistication of the audience and the camera technology where you can see and do so much more, does that provide a greater challenge for you? And how has your workflow changed as a result? I think that the workflow has changed for us in the, in the fact that there's no limitation anymore. For a long time, there was limitation. Uh, things like um, uh, the studios coming in and, and uh, they take a vehicle and uh, they go out and they shoot it and they suddenly realize, oh man, we got the car going left to right and we really need it right to left. Um, now they can flop the, the stuff, and they can flop the guy that's inside driving and put him on the inside. They can reverse the typeface on the side of the car. There's all these things that they can do that they couldn't do before. Um, and uh, now if, uh, if for some reason they're filming and, and they happen to see that, that there's a door removed that has a camera rig attached to it, um, they can go ahead and they can do that because in post they can put a door back on the car later and, and they don't have to worry about that. So it changes kind of the scope of what we do, but I think that it's almost like instead of uh, being limited that we're working with a pencil, now we have a pen, now we have markers, now we have paintbrush, now we have, we have all these different tools that you can work with. It's, it's really exciting. And, and, you, and now cars can do anything that you can dream up. They can jump from building to building. They can go up sides of buildings. They can do things that you just couldn't ever conceive of doing before. My, you know, my brother and my, uh, uh, my dad are writers. And, um, 
And now it's just, you know, they'll call me up and say, hey, you know, I, I need this really cool chase scene uh, and we can pretty much do whatever we want because CG is not, not as expensive as it used to be. Um, you know, how do we solve getting from this point to this point? So we'll come up with a really cool idea that, that has the car spin in a certain way or roll, rolls in a, as a, in a corkscrew. Or there's, just, there's just infinite ways that you can create, solve issues. It's a lot more fun. It's opened up a lot oh, more. It's, yeah, it's a total playground. It's a total playground. You know, it's, and it's, it's really a blast. And does it require you to pay more attention to fine detail? Because the audience is seeing things that they wouldn't have seen before? Absolutely, and you, you learn to see things that you didn't see before. Uh, you learn to notice textures of, of, uh, of trees, of, of things, you know, when a car goes past, you know, directors are looking at, at not only textures, but colors, light, uh, shade, uh, contrast, hues, all these different, different things that you wouldn't consider. Um, when I, was, uh, when I was young, uh, I used to sit next to Sid Mead, who was a designer, did designs for Blade Runner and a lot of things, and he showed me this painting he did of the Grand Canyon. It was about this long, and it was broken up into five sections, like you were looking through five different color panes of glass into the Grand Canyon. And I thought, that is extraordinary. If I was looking through rose-tinted glasses to the Grand Canyon, or blue tint, or green, or something, um, it, was a, it was a mind-blowing experience because it made me understand and uh, understand color in a way that I never envisioned. Uh, and I realized going to school, they still didn't, didn't even know that kind of stuff. So I feel really blessed that I've been, I've been trained in a lot of different ways. And, uh, and my parents really um, egged me on with everything I did, whether it was right or wrong. They said, you know, try that, you know, see if it works. If it doesn't, you know, move on to the next thing. So um, you just keep plugging forward. And... Uh, um, you learn to blaze your own trail. Sounds like it's a, it's a good wealth of experience. Uh, let's see, back to the chat room. Boo Bird, hope you're liking the show. <laughs> if 10 years from now we're all driving hybrids or electric cars, how will that change what you do? So um, reality imitates, art imitates life and so forth. How would that type of change affect? Well, it's already changing uh, what we do. Uh, we want to incorporate more green technology in everything that we do. Uh, I currently work with a company called Lifetime Oil Filter. It's an oil filter you never have to change. Um, uh, it eliminates uh, putting uh, oil filters into landfills. It eliminates the usage of oil. It does a lot of really fantastic things. And, and we use, try to use that on every vehicle. Um, uh, we are, every project vehicle we do for SEMA, any custom builds we do, we recommend as much green technology as we can. The thing is that not everybody's in a position to buy a brand new Prius or an Insight or, or something that's, that's green. So you have to find ways to make existing vehicles greener, you know. And, and we're heavily into that. You know, that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I live in a, in, a, in, a, in a town that's very eco-friendly and uh, very conscious. And I drive a Tahoe, so I, I have to be very, you know, be, I have to think clearly about what it is that we want to achieve with things like that. So. Has, has Hollywood started requesting more hybrid vehicles for movies or not so much? Uh, not so much, mm -hmm. but I think that it's, you know, you have to do your part. You know, I, I don't. No, it's I'm not, great. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't sit back and wait for them to decide. But I think that if if there's an option, and it makes a, a um, obviously, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do a hybrid Batmobile right. just yet. Right. But uh, uh, but there may be a case to say that you know new technology. But I, I think you would be more like hydromatic, blah 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 drive. Right. You know. Right. Uh, you know, for the movies. But um, and those cars aren't driven that much, so they're not necessarily. Uh, uh, ruin the environment as far as uh, using them on such a limited space, but right. There's certainly a scientific jargon way, blah 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 yeah. way to work that in. Yeah, and it's but it's about the story, you know. Right. But I think that if there's an opportunity to use a green vehicle, uh, we're not going to sit and wait for someone to ask for it. I think that we're going to provide that as one of the, the the smart solutions. Let's see if I can pronounce this. Chum Lodio. Hopefully, I got that right, Chum. Thanks for putting your question in. Was the Batmobile built on an existing vehicle or from the ground up? Was it really drivable, or were the driving sequences effects? Uh, the answer, it was built on two Imperial chassis that were put together. The car was about 20 feet long. It was, it was pretty good size. It was drivable, but uh, uh, several of them were, were built. So some were shells, uh, some were hero cars that um, were for close-ups and things like that. Um, a lot of them have been built since then. Uh, uh, individuals have built much nicer versions, right. you know, that drive really well. Right. But you know, it's like it's not something you plan on, on making a U-turn in. It's right. just not something that's that makes a lot of sense to drive on on uh, LA freeways or anything like that. But yeah, they have to be functional. They have to be. Um, you go through the script and you say, okay, uh, this stunt has to be achieved. Is that make is that something that we can do in this one vehicle, or do you have to build two? And and the biggest challenge for like Son of the Mask was they had the budget to build one car, and that's something you never want to hear. Um, but that's all they had because 
uh, they had all these stunts and they had all the stuff that they had to achieve. And, you know, and you screw up the car with something as simple as what uh, Bumblebee went into and crashed into another truck. You know, they had the budget to build, you know, 30 bumblebees, no big deal. But when you have a movie that doesn't have the luxury of a budget like that, uh, and you're biting your nails, you know, uh, hoping that, that the stunt guys know what they're doing and, and, uh, and nothing happens to the car. Now, unlike Batman, where you just did a few sketches, now between you and Cinema Vehicles, you creatively come up with the concepts and, and you build them to order. Yeah, that can be certainly one of the cases. Uh, it goes everything from the extreme of, of creating something that's completely unique, that's uh, from the ground up, uh, to something that's, that is just rented out to the studio. If, if they have a movie that takes place in the 50s, uh, the studio will come and pick all the 50s cars, clean them all up, and then, and then deliver them all to set. Okay. Now, what other kind of like different cars do you have on your lot at cinema? You have cars that look like total wrecks, but they can, they're still drivable. You have cars that have bullet holes in the windshield. What else you got? Uh, well, yeah, well, there's a section called the graveyard. It's where all the cars come back and they've been baked. You know, they've been blown up. And, and, uh, but they still go out because there's movies that are, that are, that are post-apocalyptic and they need stuff that's, you know, that's already burned out hulks that uh, you don't want to take them out there and, and burn them up just for, for that. They come back with bullet holes. I mean, we, we did the cars for the movie Faster and, and it came back with bullet holes. It came back rolled. Sometimes you don't know how they're going to use them, you know. Right. But uh, uh, the neat thing is that uh, although that's the, the physical side of, of building the cars in the Hollywood garage on, the, on the, 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 the website, we get a chance to, to share a lot of, the, of aspects of the vehicles that behind the scenes stuff that, you, that they didn't use in the movie. Uh, as an example, for Faster, the car, as I mentioned, was never rolled and it, it didn't get shot at. He drove off into the sunset. Um, but they did shoot a scene where the two cars crashed into each other and he crashed and the, the car flipped over and everything. And uh, so you get to see a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. Very nice. Now you've got two movies coming out, Captain America and Mission Impossible 4. What's coming up for you in those? Uh, Captain America, those were some classic cars that were just uh, maintained and built for that. There was not necessarily much design involved with that. Right. And then for uh, a Mission Impossible 4, I'm not even necessarily sure I'm allowed to say, but uh, we built a few vehicles that were reinforced um, uh, to, to do certain stunts. Um, you're dealing with a very high profile film and uh, uh, everything has to be uh, very uh, strategic to spec. Um, uh, yeah, I can't. I can't say too much about it okay. other than than they were they they weren't necessarily designed as far as something like the Batmobile, but they were reinforced to do uh, some very very elaborate stunts. Okay, um, cars in movies are oftentimes asked to do things that regular cars aren't: pull, push, people jumping out of on two. Mm -hmm. Any is that a, a particular challenge to you, or is that just a regular part of your job? Well, that's uh, that's really not so much my job because you know I'm not an engineer. I can I can point out you know what. Uh, what looks good, because what the camera's gonna see, what it's not gonna see. As being a conceptualist, uh, you know, you can say, well, uh, this car's gonna do this kind of stunt, and, and I know that they're gonna want to be able to see this, so you can't have a rig sticking out the side of the car. Um, if the car goes on two wheels, you don't wanna see the underside. In a lot of the older movies in the 70s and 80s, you'll see a car flip over, and if you, stare, if you step through it, you'll see the, 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 um, the pump that will, will project the car over and you do it th 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 and you see this right. long thing sticking on it, you know, it's still cheese ball, you know, but, um, you know, they've eliminated that completely because now they can go ahead and do it. Right. And then in post, they just, you know, take that thing out. So everything looks, you know, fancy and looks perfect. So it's cool. Let's see in the chat room, the alien returns wants to ask, here's one being a car designer and a car enthusiast. What is your dream street car? Oh man. Uh, the one that's got four wheels. <laughs> um, I think that uh, uh, it, it's kind of an addiction, you know, is that uh, I love all cars, you know, and uh, uh, there's people that, that are muscle car guys, that are rat rods, that are, that are classics, that are tuners, you know, and, and I, I think that more than cars is I love the people that love the cars. I love listening to their, their stories. I'd love to know what car you have and, and why, why it's cool to you. Uh, that's why we have the shows that we do on the Hollywood Garage. Um, we like to feature, you know, people's passion for vehicles. And I have a tremendous passion, but when I was a kid, you know, the hardest thing that you can say to a kid is, you know, which uh, Johnny Lightnings or which Hot Wheels do you, do you like? You can take that to the show with you. And you sit there going, uh, you know, and then you just want to bring them all with you, you know? And so that, that's a hard thing for me, but uh, um, I appreciate design tremendously. Uh, I love uh, the Ferrari 458 Italia. I love the Bugatti Veyron, simply because it's such a, a massively, uh, 
powerful vehicle. Um, I love uh, design cues of the new Camaro. Um, I think there's some tremendous stuff being put out by Jaguar and Aston Martin. Um, uh, I think Aston Martin and, and Jaguar both have these supercars that are just absolutely stunning. They're, they're gorgeous design expressions. Um, but I love them for different reasons than I love a, a Malibu SS, you know, or, a, or a 60, any kind of 60s muscle car, you know. So there's different aspects to that. In, in doing stuff in film, you learn to appreciate uh, all cars because you're being asked to do every and all, any kind of car that you can think of. So We're going to give out your uh, website link again in just a moment, but I noticed uh, one of the many things you have on your website are links to a lot of great car chases, yeah. car scenes and movies. What are some, what, what's one or two of your favorite car chase scenes in movies? And real quick, what makes a good car chase? What makes a bad one? Well, I, w one of my favorites for sure is uh, the movie Eagle Eye. And there was an absolutely brutal car chase in there that I had mentioned to you previously. And, and uh, um, you felt like you were in it. You know, you were being given the experience. It was almost a little uncomfortable at the way things were hitting each other. Um, the, the, the key, I think, to a successful car chase on film is the, the fact that the, the director has to be very clear about what he wants to achieve. Uh, the editor has to be someone that is really in tune with that. And, and the sound guys, you know, everybody's got to be on, on, when you say, you know, you got to be on the same page, you know, that's a given, you know, but, but that can only go so far. It's, it's the expression, the emotion that you want to capture, you know, is, you know, a car chase, can be uh, um, something like Bullet, it can be something like Eagle Eye, it can be something like Transformers. Each one is a different animal. Each one tries to achieve a different type of thing. You know, that, that there's more, there's more uh, stress in this one, there's more comedy in this one, there's more, you know, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. So uh, Eagle Eye was a, was a great chase. Um, I think that uh, um, uh, Michael Bay has some great chases in the new Transformers. Um, uh, it's hard to say. I have uh, there's so many on on at least my personal blog that I that I enjoy. Uh, um, I think that it, it's it's really about how how they want to convey that emotion, you know. And uh, so true to whatever the emotion is of the film. Yeah, right? and at the same time, if, you know, if it's a horror movie, the chase should scare you. If it's a, <laughs> well, if it's maybe, a comedy, but, it should make you you know. It but should... as I said, there's 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 so many ways to screw things up in a movie. It's amazing that a movie gets made and it comes out and you can walk out of the theater going, wow, that was really great, you know. But like if you watch the movie The Rock, The Rock was, was a pretty good movie and enjoyable. It was a popcorn film. But in the, right in the middle of it, there's this completely random car chase between Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage that, with, with a Hummer and a Ferrari. And it's really cool, but you could have taken the whole thing out and had a great movie. Or you could watch the car chase all by itself and have a great car chase. But they really, for me, didn't really fit together so well. It didn't make so much sense because the car chase was like 14 minutes long. Right. But I think the ultimate car chase everybody would know would be the original Gone in 60 Seconds. It's a 40-minute car chase. Forget who cares about the rest of the movie. It's right. like, you know, it just fast forward right to the car chase and just sit here and, and watch, you know, this just the coolest car chase that was ever shot. It was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that... Um I found on Popular Mechanics they were raiding car chases, and that was one of the ones that made its top ten, I believe. Um, real quick, for indie film, do you work predominantly with studios, or if there are indie filmmakers out there watching, do you work with independents? Do you have to have a huge budget to utilize your services? Yeah, kind of always the big question is that that um, if you have an independent film, it's, uh, we can't we can't have a car built because it's too much. Of, and the reality is that yeah, the studios may have a five hundred million dollar budget, uh, or they may they may have a $5 million for vehicles, but uh, commercials don't have $5 million. You know, uh, we build a lot of stuff for commercials, a lot of stuff for television, uh, a lot of stuff for independent films, um, and, and promotional corporate vehicles that if Pepsi comes in or, or Red Bull wants a, you know, a bunch of stuff, uh, we build those too. The, the thing is there's a lot of way to, ways to be able to solve that problem, and it doesn't have to uh, you know, bleed you dry. You know, the, the point is that what is it that you have and what is it that you want to achieve, and then you have to figure out the best way. Sometimes it requires to, to paint the car. Sometimes you want to wrap it in vinyl. Uh, there's, uh, there's cheaper ways. There's a lot of ways to adjust to create the same kind of thing. So Definitely worth an independent filmmaker checking out your websites and giving you a call. Totally. Uh, let's see. In the chat room, we have a question from Banam Banadana Manadu. I feel like I should know. Is that some sort of song from an old sitcom or something? Um, do any car creations ever have to be uh, blown up, and do you feel pain at that? Um, sometimes. I think, I think certainly, uh, you know, when, 
when when you collect all these uh, these cars for uh, for the generally for for Dukes of Hazard, and they proceed to trash them all, you, you almost watch a generation being cut away. You know, but and that can be hard sometimes. But the the reality is that. I think it gets outweighed by the fact that the audience gets to go to this movie and enjoys it and has a good time, and and that's the ultimate goal at the end of the at the end of the um, the end of the build. Is this is this going to solve the problem, uh, uh, the challenge for the film, and and uh, although you know something that you spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on uh, to make look right, you know it's going to go out and be blown up. Well, you know, hopefully the director makes it look really cool when it goes up, you know, and everybody enjoys it and. Uh, and you feel good about that, that it, it, it gives people really quality entertainment. Okay, I want to get to one more uh, chat room question for you as we wrap up here. Sean O would like to ask, what happens to the vehicles after shooting? Well, um, it depends on what kind of shape they're in, but if you can think of it, that's probably what happens. They'll end up in museums, they'll end up in the, the producer or the director's uh, or the actor's garage. Uh, it'll go to a private collector, it may go to auction. Or you reuse them, right? There was one I saw in one of your YouTube videos that was in one movie and then got put into the island. Right, right. Uh, the uh, Minority Report. Minority Report yeah. vehicle the went Lexus. from Minority Report right. to the island, right. Right. So it'll get repainted. It'll get rebuilt sometimes. Uh, if it's really cool, obviously it's worth keeping. Uh, a lot of times it will um, uh, go into storage at the shop because there may, it may be a potential of a sequel. So obviously you don't want to throw all those assets away. Absolutely. So you want to be able to use them again uh, in some capacity. Um, so uh, the answer would be yes. It, it, you know, it, All the above. it can happen in, in any sorts of ways. You know, I'm just hoping that you know some of them end up in my garage. That's right. You know? Absolutely. Well, it's a great garage you have. So uh, let's go ahead and give out your website again. I think I may have mentioned it now. I'll have you mention it. It's got great information, links to other blogs, your own podcast that you do every week where you talk about the film business and everything else. So that website is uh, the, ho the HollywoodGarage.com. Great, and then from there you can get to your YouTube page and your blog and everything. Absolutely, we have a, a lot of, uh, of automotive Hollywood content, uh, new shows that go up on the homepage each week, and uh, everything that's uh, how automobiles relate to film and how film uses cars and movies. And uh, it's just a neat, re a really cool hub where those two worlds collide. And you host your own segments, and you go on location, and you test out cars, and right. you give your opinions. A lot of great stuff there. Yeah. And on your podcast, you get a little goofy. Um, <laughs> I happen to listen to a few, and you ask these really bizarre questions. So I'm going to answer one for you. Okay. On his podcast, he says, hey, I wonder what bald people put for the color of their hair on their driver's license. <laughs> So the answer to that question, <laughs> since I can answer for you, is you do put your natural God-given hair color. Ah, okay. So on my driver's license, it does, in fact, say brown. <laughs> <laughs> you can go by the eyebrows. And I'm going to go by the eyebrows. Uh, right, but lots right. of good ponderings and fun and humor well, in, we in addition to... Well, we try to ask the important questions. You do. You, you, know, do. you get to them all. Yeah, people want to know the answers people. to those questions. So the question that we like to get everyone out of here on is, do you have a favorite set speak term? So back to one, for example. And you were a, a storyboard artist prior to a concept design, and you've been on sets. So do you have a favorite set speak? term? Uh, absolutely. Our, our, the, the favorite term of mine and of just about everybody I know is that this is the martini shot. That means it's the last shot of the day, the last shot of the film. It means that uh, we've done a, had a successful shoot, uh, that everyone's done what they need to do, and we just need this one last shot, and everyone's excited because this is the one, and, uh, and when that's complete, there's a, a tremendous uh, sense of relief and accomplishment. So it's, uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty great experience. Sounds good. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and having you on. Thank you for having me. It's been awesome. My pleasure. Well, that is going to do it for this edition of Film Nut. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Fireball Tim. also want to give a special thanks to Stephen and Diane Wallman of Kaimu Nurseries in Hawaii, and that's south of Hilo on the Big Island. Stephen and Diane, it's uh, really nice having all those orchids that you give us that we have here around our studio, so I definitely want to thank you for that. Everyone here at thestream.tv is definitely enjoying them. They are a pleasure. They give more life to the studio. Until next time here on Filmlet, I will see you then.